Welcome to Market Pulse, pros and pioneers. Each week, we talk with industry leaders in both marketing and entrepreneurship and business to find out all about their wins and failures in marketing. Right now, we'll hear all about their successes and wins and what's fallen flat so that you can take that knowledge and implement it. Learn from the best, from the folks who've been there and done it all, as well as people just like you. Thanks for joining us. This is Market Pulse, pros and pioneers. Hello and welcome back to Market Pulse Pros and Pioneers podcast. Um, this week's guest is the one and only David B. Horn. Um, I'm going to introduce David in just a moment. Uh, if you don't know David, um, he's the founder of Add Then Multiply. So, um, where's that gone? Where's it gone? <laughs> Let me try that again. Sorry. He's the. F- right. Let me introduce you to David. He's the founder of Add Then Multiply. So they're a consultancy that work exclusively with business founders who want to grow fast. Um, I'm not going to give too much of David's background because I'd love David to tell us the story. Um, he's also an author of a number one Amazon best-selling book and a founder of, found, of Funding Focus, um, a social enterprise. So uh, he's also got a, a second book that's come out and it has a TEDx talk as well. So David, um, that's that's a phenomenal background and starting point. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing um, the version of events that kind of led to all that coming to fruition for you. Um, but just before we get started, Wonderful, I just need to do a, a quick thank you to our sponsors for today's show, um, gridbank.io. Um, so if you're listening to this, you probably know that I'm all about building content at scale. Um, sometimes you just need a faceless video reel to get content out there. But the problem with a lot of footage banks that are out there is that they just don't look native to social posts. Um, and that actually can hinder um, your content's performance, believe it or not. So gridbank.io is a database of endless kind of vertical, authentic video clips that are great for pumping out concepts, A-B tests, thumbnails, and creating authentic looking edits. So if you're looking to get ahead on socials without burning out your team, you can get 10% off your subscription, your annual subscription at gridbank.io with code Paul. Um, You'll not regret it. Honestly, it's a really cool platform and I have used it myself. I really like it. So back to you, David. Thank you very much for uh, bearing with us. Um, let's okay. start with your fun fact. And it's uh, that's, that's a, a culinary fact, if you remember what, what it was that you put on the form. I do. Uh, culinary might be an interesting twist on it. Um, I think my fun fact is that I can drink a pint of beer while standing on my head. Yeah, uh, something I learned uh, many, many years ago. Well, you know, it's it's sort of defying gravity and all of that, but 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 thankfully the you know the, the the muscles and things in your in your throat and esophagus work and and it it's yeah it's it feels a bit weird, but it you, I've I've seen other people do it, um, not many, but <laughs> yeah. I think you and I hang about with a different crowd. I won't do a live demonstration. That's a, that's a, that's, that's a different podcast, I think. Um, yeah, perfect. Um, so yeah, if you would give us a, a short background on, on how you got where you are. It's a fascinating journey that you've had, David. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I, um, I was born and raised in Canada in Vancouver. Um, I trained as a chartered accountant with PwC, uh, qualified with them a long time ago, 1987. And then I moved with PwC from Vancouver to Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, was an auditor uh, with them for two years and then joined my biggest client, a big uh, international tech group uh, called NCR uh, that then got bought out by AT&T. Uh, so I transferred within that group. And um, in 1993, we moved to London with AT&T um, and I stayed with them for another four and a bit years. And then I had a couple of years at the BBC, which was a fascinating place. I love the BBC, but um, the BBC and I were not meant to work with each other. Yeah, I, I couldn't I couldn't deal with the politics in there and and I was far too commercial for a lot of the people. So we parted amicably at the end of 99. And then I, I went on a 10 year journey where I was uh, between 2000 and 2010, where I was the CFO of three very different companies that all had one thing in common. The first one was a PR agency. The second one was an AIM listed digital media and publishing group, AIM being the alternative investment market, which is the junior market on the London Stock Exchange. And the third one was also AIM listed, and it was a online auctioneer of used industrial equipment. So these are totally different businesses. But what they all had in common was that they raised capital and bought other companies. 
And so I became a bit of an expert in, in fundraising and M&A, not from the perspective of an investment banker or a venture capitalist or a corporate finance advisor, but actually inside the company doing the work. Um, and um, I, I left that world in, in 2010. I had my midlife crisis. I tried to launch a wine business, which was tremendous fun, but not very successful. Um, I still have the wine business today, as my best friend puts it. It's a tax effective way to enjoy my hobby. I'm the biggest customer of the wine business by some measure. So, <laughs> but um, but uh, yeah, every now and then, when 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 I need to send someone a nice gift and I know they like wine, I can I can get them something pretty special. So that's cool. Um, and yeah, so since 2012, I've worked exclusively with uh, founders of companies. Um, initially, I was starting with quite small businesses, and and gradually over time, I came to realize that actually my sweet spot is is businesses that are turning over kind of two to 20 million pounds. So they're already established. There's there's no issues about product market fit. They've they've built up to a size where, you know, you've got you, you've probably got the founder or founders still in there, but they've got a, a management team who's in there as well. Um, and they're covering off the kind of all of the core functions. And then I work with them on implementing a scale up strategy um, based on um, based on a, a methodology that I've created called FACE, F-A-C-E, which stands for fund, acquire, consolidate and exit and is written about in detail in this book, Add Then Multiply, which remarkably was published coming up on five years ago. It'll be five years in uh, in June since the book's been out. And and, and I have to say the book has been a real game changer uh, in, in two areas. Uh, in the first area, it forced me to think, okay, this is this is my focus. This is what I do. Therefore, everything else is what I don't do. And it enabled me to exit some long-standing client relationships where it wasn't really what I where I was going, but I I kind of felt loyal to the clients, and this enabled me to say, look, where where you're going is great, but it doesn't match with where I'm going. So let's find you someone who can who can come in and and, and pick it up and, and run forward. So that was good because I'm quite a loyal person, and I you know I I hate to say to clients, you know, oh well, I don't want to work with you anymore. So we just we were able to find a nice exit pathway for that. And the other thing that's been really cool about the book is it's just it's it's a it's like an instant credibility piece. You know, you go into a meeting with a prospective client and you're talking about something and you're having a conversation. And, you know, at the end of the at the end of the meeting, it's, well, here, here's a copy of my book and I've signed it for you. And people go like, oh, wow. And it's just it's it's I mean, it's just it's it's really cool um, how just how much additional credibility that gives you in a marketplace. And it was a result of the book coming out. I started getting invited to speak at events. I was speaking at an event in, in Reading about four years ago uh, about fundraising. And after my talk, a woman came up and asked me why so little funding went to female founders. And I, I looked at her and I said, I have no idea, but I'll find out. And um, what I found out was pretty shocking and led to me creating a social enterprise and writing my second book, Funded Female Founders, which came out two years ago. And uh, so, yeah, so that's, that's, that's kind of a, a very quick trot through my career. That's a fantastic story. It's it's you know I, I guess you could argue, and obviously this is a this is a market and focus podcast. I guess you could very convincingly argue that the the book itself has been your <coughs> biggest strategy for um, the making your business a success, right? And, and and also driving focus for you at the same time. So that's really cool to hear that that's done. Yeah. And I guess I guess there's two sorts of books out there in the world, and I'm I'm always a little bit cautious when I talk to somebody who says they're an author because. We all know that there's the books that you can kind of get ChatGPT to write these days and and bang it onto Amazon and all of a sudden you're an author. Hey, brilliant! Um, and then there's the books that except are that Am 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 Amazon Am Amazon is Amazon is doing a lot of work to catch out books that are written by ChatGPT. So, but yeah, yes, no, you're right. No, and these were these were yeah. I mean, I mean the first the first book took me about six months. Um, it was a download from my brain, so it was simply just a matter of getting everything out. Uh, the second book took me 18 months because there was a lot of research and interviewing involved. But uh, yes, both books came out before ChatGPT was announced, so it was it was all original. It's uh, it's brilliant to see, and like, as somebody who struggles with focus and attention on something for any length of time, I've tried to write books in the past, and like I, I know there's a book in me somewhere, but I just don't have I just don't have the attention span to give it what it needs, or it's just not the priority that I think it is is the other thing that I always talk to people about is like, if it's important enough, you'll get it done. No matter how long it takes or how hard it yeah. is, you'll get it done. 
So I either haven't come yep. across the right topic yep. or conduit, <clears throat> or I really just need to book some time off to, to sit down and do things properly. So, but hats off, David. That's a, a fantastic achievement. And I guess... Thank you. In terms of where you're at today, so then um, Add Then Multiply is, is your main consultancy business right now, okay? Is that correct? Is that fair? Yeah. Correct, yeah. Um, that is fair, yeah. And so, obviously, as a as a market and focused podcast, one of the things that we want to talk about is things that are working and things that aren't working in terms of marketing those businesses. I know we, we chatted briefly before the show, and it's it's fair to say that you've got a, an approach that's very similar to my own, and it doesn't always work for a lot of industries. So there's, 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 there's quite a niche to that. So do you want to walk us through how you feel that you drive the most opportunity into your business? How do you find business founders and owners that yep. want to work with you? Yep, absolutely. Um, I mean, my, my main kind of marketing outreach media uh, channel is LinkedIn. And I do a lot of work on my LinkedIn to, you know, to make sure that I'm constantly posting. I mean, I'm posting three, four or five times a week. Um, I've got a newsletter now that's got uh, nearly 3000 followers. Um, so just, I mean, one of the key things is consistently putting out content. And it's it, one of the things that really intrigues me is, you know, I'll, I'll be at an event and I'll bump into somebody that I'm connected with and, and, and they'll say, oh, I've been following all your content. And I said, well, why don't you why don't you hit the like button or, or post a comment? I mean, it's great that you're seeing it, but please engage. Um, so, I, you know, that's 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 a that's a key thing. I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm a very outgoing person. So I love going to events. I love going to, you know, networking functions. Um, I'm a member of a couple of uh, organizations in here in London where, you know, where they, they put on regular events that I go out and, you know, meet people. And as a result of that, I've, I've, I've built up a, you know, a reasonably wide network. From a marketing perspective, uh, when I look at my business today, all of my main clients have actually been inbound leads from people who said, oh, you need to talk to David. Uh, and that's then when you know cases of wine get shipped out to people and things like that. <laughs> so, but yeah, no. So, so David, I think there's there's a lot of businesses out there that they start out because they've got connections in the space in the industry that they want to reach and they they know they can sell directly to their network and then they kind of get lost in that referrals and partnerships space. Uh, people make it too hard for people to refer to them. They're not clear enough on what they do, so people struggle to refer to them. And I, you know, I've just been yep. through a course myself in, you know, in, in strategy and partnerships. Big shout out to Dave who, who runs that course. It's fantastic. I think that there is a, like, the, 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 the LinkedIn gurus will have you believe that it doesn't work for long and you've got to have another approach. You've got to have, you know, um, pay per click. You've got to have a really good website. You've got to be doing all these things that can become quite expensive. But the truth of the matter is, for certain businesses, and not this doesn't apply to every business, but certainly in the B2B space, it's very possible to have a very strong referral network. So I guess the, the, the question yeah. would be to you is, how do you go about making sure that your network understand how to market you? Because that's effectively what they're doing, right? Mm, yeah, what a good question. Um, I, I, I couldn't honestly say that I've set a fixed strategy on how to do that. What I, what I do... Uh, and this is something that I learned from a previous client who was one of the clients that was in that bit that didn't fit with where I'm going. But uh, what I learned from the founder of that business is when I'm when I'm meeting somebody new, as the conversation evolves and develops and it looks like there might be something going on, one of the first questions I ask is, what kind of stuff can I refer to you? Yes. So I'm already giving before there's anything happening. And I find that really helps to open a relationship um, and it's, yeah, like, like I remember on a number of occasions with, with this particular chap and, you know, I would, I would introduce him to someone that was in my network and then he would go out and reach out to them. And then I'd speak to the people in my network and they'd say, yeah, it was amazing. His first question was, well, what can I do to help bring business to you? As opposed to, you know, Hey, this is what I do. Please buy it. So, so, you know, I've, I've, I've adapted that. I've adapted that. And, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's sort of the old, you know, givers get kind of thing. You know, and, and, and uh, I get, sorry, I think I've got a little bit of lag edit. Yeah, no, um, 
I, I was just I was just going to say so edit <laughs> one one of the other things about about LinkedIn and I'm I'm sure you see this as well is you know you you connect with someone and 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 all of a sudden the first message you get is hi my name's Fred and this is my company and this is what we do and you know I think you should sign up here and here's a link to my Calendly can we have a call tomorrow like give me a break let's build a relationship just be different you know pe- pe- at the end of the day people buy from people. People buy from people that they know, like, and trust. So build build a relationship and then figure out where to sell. I think that this, this kind of leads on to um, a problem I see a lot in a lot of businesses. And, and certainly, I think, in the independent space and the startup space is that businesses start out, like I said, because they've got a network that they can sell to. And that they've probably already talked to about the idea and they're all warm to it. The problem comes when that network, initial network dries up and you haven't done the legwork to shore up what comes next and where you get your leads from next. And you get that moment of yeah. pure panic. So I, I look on, yes. I'm always a little bit sympathetic for people who drop in my inbox in that way because one, it's clear they don't know any better. And two, they're just trying to pay the bills like I am. So as annoying as it is, I kind of get <laughs> where they're coming from as much as it's annoying. And it just makes me want to kind of put an arm around the shoulder and go, Do you know what? There are better ways of doing this, and you probably should have. The best exactly. plant, the best time to plant a tree was twenty years ago. Second exactly. best time to plant a tree is right now. Right now, um, yep. and just kind of. But it's amazing how many of those people just aren't open to trying anything different, and that's where I start to get frustrated. Is you've got to be open, you've got to be adaptable, and when you do come across somebody who wants to help you change what you're doing, just listen. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the problem is is I think I think the problem is that some of them work for large, well-funded organizations that have hired an army of salespeople and they've been given a script and they've been told this is what you do and they follow it. And yeah. you know, maybe one in a hundred work. Who knows? Yeah. But imagine imagine, you know, thinking about it from a sales management perspective, imagine if you could change that one in a hundred to three in a hundred tripling your 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 sales potential so you know yeah okay it might take a couple of extra weeks but again it's it's that you know it's that thinking thinking a little longer term and especially you know and 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 i know what it's like when you start out i i I know what it's like when you start out because i know what it's like when you start out because i had exactly the same thing in the wine business you know and i i started reaching out to my network and all of a sudden the feedback I was getting from people was, well, hang on, you're a, you're a listed company CFO. Why are you trying to flog me wine? And, and it was just like, you know, I had to re-educate the market. And, and I think, you know, I, I look at it now when I get, when I get those kind of LinkedIn connections and someone tries to sell me something, I just, I have a standard thing that I've saved in my, in my notes and I just cut and paste it in. And, and I just say, rather than trying to sell me, don't you want to, you know, get to know who I am and what I'm interested in? I think though that there's also and the other, the other one I sometimes the other side of things which is where people kind of come in and they're all like I got one the other day that was asking me um, how long I've been following Gar- Gary V on LinkedIn I'm like he, there's there's about two and a half million people that follow Gary V and he's very well known the likelihood is that anybody you connect with will follow Gary V that is a pretty loose cannon yep. and it's clearly a, a a first step before you then slap me with something so. And like my, my response was, yeah. how about I show you a better way? Because I, you know I show people how to educate their audience through video content on LinkedIn. That's 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 my day job. Absolutely. And actually, that's a much absolutely nicer yeah. Just go, hey, um, you know, you will probably get value from the content I'm producing. Come and have a look at what's on my feed. If you're interested, then you know, yeah. of course we can do business. And if not, yeah. well, have a fantastic yeah. week. And we're probably not suited to each other. That's fine. Exactly. No, but it's interesting you say that because I'm I'm currently doing a, a series where I'm I'm reading this to camera. I mean, it's available on audio and, and on, on Audible and, and all that. But I'm just I'm doing a, 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 a read to camera, and then my my um, my digital marketing guy and my team is then cutting that down into you know thirty sixty second yeah. clips, and then we'll just we'll just drip feed them out. But yeah, it's just putting that content out to the marketplace. And that's it. You know, um, people can take your your processes and your strategy and everything. And you, if you give that away for free, they get the value from that. But actually, the ones that can put it into practice would probably put it into practice some way, shape or form themselves anyway, because they're capable and they were never your customer. Yep. yep. Um, but what they can't do with yep. that, no matter how much information you give them, is they haven't got you. 
And that's where the real value of consulting comes from, is that they can't replicate you, your yes. knowledge, your experience and processes. And what yep. seems a simple thing can actually be very complex in practice to try and do yourself if you've never done it before. Very. Yeah, very, very. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I always, you know, people talk about, oh, you know, that seems so expensive. And I always say, well, you know, refer back to Richard Branson, who always says, get the best advisors you can. He, I mean, early, early in his career, he got into a spot of bother with, uh, with the VAT man when they were, they were importing records and, and, and falsifying stuff. And uh, he, he went out and got the best lawyers and accountants to support him in the case. And they were able to get it all through and sorted. And ever since, he's always said, get the best, get the best professional advisors that you can. It's worth it. Yep. You know, I mean, if you think about it, let's say you're doing a deal worth 10 million quid. And you hire a cheap lawyer to do the documents for you and something goes wrong and the deal falls apart versus you hire a lawyer that's going to cost you, you know, maybe 25, 30, 40 grand. But they've been doing this for 50 years. They've done 6,000 deals like it. They know exactly what the issues are. They advise you and support you and guide you. And, you know, it makes sure that the deal goes through. And, and then all of a sudden it's a 10 million pound deal and it, it you know, the size of your company. So, yeah, so uh, yeah, part of part of the challenge is getting people to start thinking longer term. And again, that's why I don't deal with sub two million pound businesses anymore, because their mindset is in a different place. And it's not that there's anything wrong with them. It's it's a you know I I I, I applaud anyone who's starting a business, but for the stuff that I'm doing around fundraising and M and A, you can't do that with teeny tiny companies because i mean even if you could you know the the, the founders would end up be, being diluted down so heavily when when any amount of, of serious money was raised yeah perfect so i guess just before we wrap up the show david uh, first of all it's been a it's been a genuine pleasure to have a chat with you and it's been some really interesting insights shaking out likewise i hope that people can kind of we get a lot of business owners that are watching the podcast so hopefully you know there's some actionable stuff or some thoughts in there that they can start to articulate a little bit um if you could give one piece of advice to that sub two million pound business to make them more likely to get to a place where you can help them, what is the one thing that you would you would advise them to start doing today? Ooh, okay. I've had three things immediately come into my mind, so I've got to cut them down to one. As your business grows, bring in professional people so that ultimately you've got a professional salesperson on board. You've got a professional operations leader that manages all of the day-to-day -day functional, you know, delivery of whatever it is that you do to your customer. And you've got a professional finance person on board so that you can make sure that your numbers are all correct. You can get forecasts, all your filings are done, et cetera, et cetera. And you can hire those people on a fractional basis as your business grows. So it might be, you know, you hire your sales person three days a week and you hire your ops person 50% of the time and you hire your finance person one day a week or, or whatever it is as, as, in, you know, as the business uh, is growing. But ultimately, as you grow up to that kind of a threshold, you, you'll be in a position where you can afford to bring those people on full time. And that allows you as the founder to step up and to step back. Stepping up means you get out of the day-to-day -day weeds and you focus on the business, not in it. And stepping back is part of the first step of ultimately getting to the point where you have a business that runs without you needing to be in it. And I know some founders find that scary, but that's got to be your, your ultimate aim unless you, wanted, unless you want the business to be your job for the rest of your life. Yeah. So, yeah, that's my one piece of advice. Great summary. I love it. David, if people want to reach out to um, talk to you more about your, your ideas and strategies, and if we've got a two million pound business that's that's interested in working with you, how can they find out more information? How can they contact you? Yeah, so uh, on my website, addthenmultiply.com, so just like the name of the book, uh, which is also the name of the company, so addthenmultiply.com, and there's a contact page, um, or on LinkedIn, uh, David B. Horn. Um, and, um, yeah, just say that you, met, you, you saw me on, uh, on, on the podcast and I will happily connect with you. As long as it's not combined with a pitch slap, right? Fantastic. All right. Thanks very much. Thanks for joining us for the show this week. If you're listening along and we will see you next week for another exciting guest. Thank you. 
Thanks for joining us for today's show. Hope you enjoyed it. If you would like to feature on a future show, or you've got some ideas for folks who would make a great guest, please drop us a line. The contact details are in the show notes. We'd love to hear from you. Your host today was Paul Banks, founder at Javelin Content Management. Javelin specializes in helping busy business owners just like you to repurpose video content, taking all the stress and tech problems away, and turning your long-form video into literally hundreds of pieces of content without breaking the bank. If you want to launch your personal brand, become the vendor of choice for your audience, or maximize your sales revenue impact, we'd love to hear from you. Join us next week for the next episode, and don't forget to give us a subscribe and a review. Our podcast is only possible with your support.